For the End, A Song of David Among the Psalms When I called upon him, the God of my righteousness heard me. Thou hast made room for me in tribulation. Pity me, and hearken to my prayer. O ye sons of men, how long will ye be slow of heart? Wherefore do ye love vanity, and seek falsehood? Pause. But know ye that the Lord has done wondrous things for his Holy One, and the Lord will hear me when I cry to him. Be ye angry, and sin not. Feel compunction upon your beds, for what ye say in your hearts. Pause. Offer the sacrifice of righteousness, and trust in the Lord. Many say, Who will show us good things? The light of thy countenance, O Lord, has been manifested towards us. Thou hast put gladness into my heart. They have been satisfied with the fruit of their corn, and wine, and oil. I will both lie down in peace and sleep, for thou, Lord, only has caused me to dwell securely. Psalm 4 to the end, a psalm song to David. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to every one that believeth. For this end signifies perfection, not consumption. Now it may be a question whether every psalm be a psalm, or rather every psalm a psalm. Whether there are some psalms which cannot be called psalms, and some psalms which cannot be called psalms. But the scripture must be attended to, if haply psalm does not denote a joyful theme. But those are called psalms which are sung to the psaltery, which the history as a high mystery declares the prophet David to have used. Of which matter this is not the place to discourse, for it requires prolonged inquiry and much discussion. Now meanwhile we must look either for the words of the Lord man after the resurrection, or of him in the church believing and hoping on him. When I called, the God of my righteousness heard me. When I called, God heard me, the psalmist said of whom is my righteousness. In tribulation thou hast enlarged me. Thou hast led me away from the straits of sadness into the broad ways of joy. For tribulation and straitness is on every soul of man that do evil. But he who says we rejoice in tribulations, knowing that tribulation works patience, up to that where he says, because the love of God is shed abroad, and our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us, he has no straits of heart, be they heaped on him outwardly by them that persecute him. Now the change of persons, for that from the third person where he says he heard, he passes at once to the second, where he says, Thou hast enlarged me. If it be not done for the sake of variety and grace, it is strange why the psalmist should first wish to declare to men that he had been heard, and afterwards address him who heard him, unless perchance, when he had declared how he was heard, in this very enlargement of heart he preferred to speak with God, that he might even in this way show what is to be enlarged in heart, that is, to have God already shed abroad in the heart, with whom he might hold converse interiorly, which is rightly understood as spoken in the person of him who, believing on Christ, has been enlightened, but in that of the very Lord man, whom the wisdom of God took, I do not see how this can be suitable, for he was never deserted by it. But as his very prayer against trouble is a sign rather of our infirmity, so often of that sudden enlargement of heart the same Lord may speak for his faithful ones, whom he has personalized also when he said, I was hungered, and ye gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink, and so forth. Wherefore here also he can say, Thou hast enlarged me. For one of the least of his, holding converse with God, whose love he has shed abroad in his heart by the Holy Spirit which is given unto us, have mercy upon me and hear my prayer. Why does he again ask, when already he declared that it had been heard and enlarged? It is for our sake, of whom it is said, But if we hope for that we see not, we wait in patience. Or is it that in him who has believed, that which is begun may be perfected? O ye sons of men, 
how long heavy in heart. Let your error, he says, have lasted at least up to the coming of the Son of God. Why then any longer are ye heavy in heart? When will you make an end of crafty wiles? If not when the truth is present, you make it not. Why do you love vanity and seek a lie? Why would you be blessed by the lowest things? Truth alone, from which all things are true, maketh blessed. For vanity is of the deceivers, and all is vanity. What profit have a man of all of his labor, wherewith he labors under the sun? Why then are ye held back by the love of things temporal? Why follow you after the last things, as though the first, which is vanity and a lie? For you would have them abide with you, which all pass away, as does a shadow. And know ye that the Lord hath magnified his Holy One, whom but him whom he raised up from below, and placed in heaven at his right hand. Therefore doth he chide mankind, that they would turn at length from the love of this world to him. But if the addition of the conjunction, for he says, and you know, is to any a difficulty, he may easily observe the scripture that this manner of speech is usual in that language in which the prophets spoke. For you often find this beginning, and the Lord said unto him, and the word of the Lord came to him, which joining by a conjunction, when no census is gone before, to which the following one may be annexed, preadventure admirably conveys to us that the utterance of truth in words is connected with that vision which goes on in the heart. Although in this place it may be said that the former sentence, Why do you love vanity and seek a lie? As if it were written, Do not love vanity and seek a lie. And being thus read, it follows in the most direct construction, and know you that the Lord hath magnified his Holy One. But the interposition of the Psalm forbids our joining this sentence with the preceding one. For whether this be a Hebrew word, as some would have it, which means, so be it, or a Greek word, which marks a pause in the psalmody, so as that psalma should be what is sung in psalmody, but the psalma, an interval of silence in the psalmody, that is the coupling of voices in singing, is called simsalma, or their separation dissalma, where a certain pause of interrupted continuity is marked. Whether I say it be the former or the latter or something else, this at least is probable, that the sense cannot rightly be continued and joined, where the Dasama intervenes. The Lord will hear me when I cry unto him. I believe that we are here warned, that with great earnestness of heart, that is, with an inward and incorporeal cry, we should implore help of God. For as we must give thanks for enlightenment in this life, so must we pray for rest after this life. Wherefore in the person, either the faithful preacher of the gospel, or of our Lord himself, it may be taken, as if it were written, The Lord will hear you when you cry unto him. Be ye angry, and sin not. For the thought occurred, Who is worthy to be heard? Or how shall the sinner not cry in vain unto the Lord? Therefore be ye angry, says he, and sin not. Which may be taken two ways. Either, even if you be angry, do not sin. That is, even if there arise an emotion in the soul, which now by reason of the punishment of sin is not in our power, at least let not our reason and the mind, which is after God regenerated within, that with the mind we should serve the law of God, although with the flesh we as yet serve the law of sin, consent thereunto, or repent ye, that is, be ye angry with yourselves for your past sins, and henceforth cease to sin. What you say in your hearts, there is understood, say ye, so that the complete sentence is, What ye say in your hearts, that say ye. That is, be ye not the people of whom it is said, With their lips they honor me, but their heart is far from me. In your chambers be ye pricked. That is what has been expressed already in heart. For this is the chamber of which our Lord warns us, that we should pray within with closed door. But be ye pricked refers either to the pain of repentance, that the soul in punishment should prick itself, that it be not condemned and tormented in God's judgment, or to arousing that we should awake to hold the light of Christ as if pricks were made use of, 
But some say that not be ye pricked, but be ye opened, is the better reading. Because in the Greek Psalter, which refers to that enlargement of the heart, in order that the shedding abroad of love by the Holy Ghost may be received, offer the sacrifice of righteousness and hope in the Lord. He says the same in another psalm, the sacrifice for God is a troubled spirit. Wherefore, that this is the sacrifice of righteousness, which is offered through repentance, it is not unreasonably here understood. For what more righteous than that each one should be angry with his own sins, rather than those of others, and that in self-punishment he should sacrifice himself unto God, or are righteous works after repentance the sacrifice of righteousness. For the interposition of the Salma not unreasonably perhaps intimates even a transition from the old life to the new life, that on the old man being destroyed or weakened by repentance, the sacrifice of righteousness, according to the regeneration of the new man, may be offered to God, when the soul now cleansed offers and places itself on the altar of faith, to be encompassed by heavenly fire, that is, by the Holy Ghost. So that this may be the meaning, offer the sacrifice of righteousness and hope in the Lord, that is, live uprightly and hope for the gift of the Holy Ghost, that the truth in which you have believed may shine upon you. But yet, hope in the Lord is as yet expressed without explanation. Now what is hope for but good things? But since each one would obtain from God that good, which he loves, and they are not easy to be found who love interior things, that is, which belong to the inward man, which alone should be loved, but the rest are to be used for necessity, not to be enjoyed for pleasure. Excellently did he subjoin when he said, Hope in the Lord. Many say, Who showeth us good things? This is the speech, and this the daily inquiry of all the foolish and unrighteous whether of those who long for the peace and quiet of a worldly life, or from the forwardness of mankind, find it not, who even in their blindness dare to find fault with the order of events, when involved in their own deservings, they deem at times worse than those which are past, or of those who doubt and despair of that future life, which is promised us, who are often saying, who knows if it's true, or whoever came from below to tell us this. Very exquisitely, then, and briefly he shows, to those, that is, who have interior sight, what good things are to be sought, answering their question, who say, who showeth us good things. The light of thy countenance, he said, is stamped on us, O Lord. This light is the whole and true good of man, which is seen not with the eye, but with the mind. But he says, stamped on us, as a penny is stamped with the king's image. For man was made after the image and likeness of God, which he defaced by sin. Therefore it is his true and eternal good, if by a new birth he be stamped. And I believe this to be the bearing of that which some understand skillfully. I mean, what the Lord said on seeing Caesar's tribute money. Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. As if he had said, in like manner, as Caesar exacts from you the impression of his image, so also does God, that as the tribute money is rendered to him, so should the soul to God, illuminated and stamped with the light of his countenance. Thou hast put gladness into my heart. Gladness, then, is not to be sought without by them, who, still being heavy in heart, love vanity and seek a lie, but within, where the light of God's countenance is stamped. For Christ dwells in the inner man, as the Apostle says, For to him do it appertain to see truth, since he hath said, I am the truth. And again, when he spake in the Apostle, saying, Would you receive a proof of Christ, who speaks within me? He spake not, of course, from without to him, but in his very heart, that is, in that chamber where we are to pray. But men, who doubtless are many, who follow after things temporal, know not to say aught else than, who showeth us good things, when the true and certain good within their very selves they cannot see. Of these accordingly is most justly said what he adds next. From the time of his corn, of wine, and oil, they have been multiplied. For the addition of his is not superfluous. 
For the corn is God's, inasmuch as he is the living bread which came down from heaven. The wine too is God's, for they shall be inebriated, he says, with the fatness of thine house. The oil too is God's, of which it is said, Thou hast fattened my head with oil. But those many who say, Who shows us good things, and who see not that the kingdom of heaven is within them, these, from the time of his corn of wine and oil, are multiplied. For multiplication does not always betoken plentifulness, and not generally scantiness. When the soul, given up to temporal pleasures, burns ever with desire, and cannot be satisfied, and, distracted with manifold and anxious thought, is not permitted to see the simple good. Such is the soul of which it is said, For the corruptible body presses down the soul, and the earthly tabernacle weigheth down the mind that museth on many things. A soul like this, by the departure and succession of temporal goods, that is, from the time of his corn, wine, and oil, filled with numberless idle fancies, is so multiplied that it cannot do that which is commanded. Think of the Lord in his goodness, and in simplicity of heart seek him. For this multiplicity is strongly opposed to that simplicity, and therefore leaving these, who are many, multiplied, that is, by the desire of things temporal, and who says, who showeth us good things, which are to be sought not with the eyes without, but with simplicity of the heart within. The faithful man rejoices and says, In peace, together, I will sleep and take rest. For such men justly hope for all manner of estrangement of mind, from things mortal, and forgetfulness of this world's miseries, which is beautifully and prophetically signified under the name of sleep and rest where the most perfect peace cannot be interrupted by any tumult, But this is not had now in this life, but is to be hoped for after this life. This even the words themselves which are in the future tense show us. For it is not said either, I have slept and taken rest, or I do sleep and take rest, but I will sleep and take rest. Then shall this corruptible put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality. Then shall death be swallowed up in victory. Hence it is said, But if we hope for what we see not, we wait in patience. Wherefore, consistently with this, he adds the last words and says, Since thou, O Lord, in singleness, has made me dwell in hope. Here he does not say, Wilt make, but has made. In whom then this hope now is, there will be it surely that which is hoped for. And well does he say in singleness, for this may refer in opposition to those many, who being multiplied from the time of his corn, of wine, and oil, say, who showeth us good things. For this multiplicity perishes, and singleness is observed among the saints, of whom it is said in the Acts of the Apostles, and of the multitude of them that believe, there was one soul and one heart. In singleness, then, in simplicity, removed, that is, from the multitude and crowd of things that are born and die, we ought to be lovers of eternity and unity if we desire to cleave to the one God and our Lord. Please consider subscribing to this channel, click the notification bell, give it a thumbs up, and leave a comment. This will result in the YouTube algorithm spreading the scripture to a larger audience. Thank you.